The other thing we saw with the decline in unions is that the middle class began to shrink. Went from roughly taking in 53% of all income down to 47% of all income as union rates dropped from 28% down to 12%, as is shown here from the years 67 to 2008. So with the decline in unions, what happened is the standards in the communities, where if, if workers weren't unionized, there was still a standard set by union contracts that permeated throughout those communities that said you better offer health care, otherwise they'll go work for that other company that has a union. You better offer a pension. You better offer de decent wages because the standard has been set in that industry. At 7% unionization now in the private sector, there are no such standards. Oh yeah, there, there's a standard, no benefits and no pensions. And of course, the next target is the public sector. Now the role that union, unions plays, I think is demonstrated well in this, in this graph here. The social contract that said, well, if productivity goes up, wages will go up as well, was in effect through 73. Then things started to change. As productivity continued to rise, but unions declined, workers weren't capturing that share of productivity. So that in effect, when you look at 1973 dollars, the weekly wage of workers has gone down from $746 down to $612. If they were being paid along the same track as the additional productivity, they'd be making over $1,100 a week. But there was no one there to advocate for them. So that didn't happen. And there are other standards, of course, that we all, understand, all know about. Health insurance, as I mentioned. Look at what happened to defined benefit pensions, guaranteed pensions, plummeted. If, you're in a, if you have a union, you might have one. But if you're not, forget about it. Vacations, not much above two weeks. That's the new standard. Now when Reagan cut those taxes, what he did is he started the buildup of the concentration of wealth in the top 1%. This graph uh, put forth by the, was in a, a uh, study done by the Fiscal Policy Institute and it shows how well the top 1% did from 1914 to 2006. And you see this gray area here. That gray area is the growth of the middle class. When the top 1% were, were, was only taking in about 10% of income, you saw the middle class grow in our country. For reasons like the tax rate on millionaires being over 90%. Unions continue to grow. Government programs like the GI Bill encouraged education of workers, veterans, and veteran housing. All those helped build the economy and build the middle class in our nation. But then along comes Reagan. What does he do? He cuts the top tax rate. He fires striking workers, which says it's, it's open season for unions. And he permits media monopolies to grow. Now there are two peaks there. 1928, which was one year before the start of the Great Depression and the crash of the market in 29. And again, 2006, right before the crash of 2008. 
When the rich have that kind of money, they gamble with it. They speculate with it. And they start boom-bust economies. But when the crash comes, they're protected. And it's working people that suffer the consequences. That's the kind of economic paradigm we have today globally. Now, when we look at what's happening here in New York, New York City, New York State, we have to ask ourselves, how many of you in the last day or two were in a third world country? Raise your hands. One, she knows the answer. Well, if you were in New York City, you, you, in terms of income inequality, you were in a third world country. While nationally, the top 1% take in 24% of all the income, at the state level, they take in 35% of all the income. And in New York City, they take, they take in 44% of all the income. That's on a par with Uruguay. We have one of the rich, richest census tracts in the country, in, in, in Manhattan. And just a few miles away, we have one of the poorest census tracts in the Bronx, all within the same city. That's the impact of this inequality. Now, where, where do they have their wealth? Almost the top. 10% control about 80% of all stock. That little red line you see is actually the bottom 20% income earners, which is, I don't know how many millions of people. But obviously, this picture demonstrates that having a low capital gains tax is just fine with them. Now, Justice Lewis Brandeis, I think, said it best. We can have concentrated wealth in the hands of the few, or we can have democracy. But we cannot have both. And we know we have concentrated wealth. In New York City, again, this is from the Fiscal Policy Institute, you see income distribution. The top 1% took in 44% of all the income, but only paid about 33% of all the taxes. While every other income group paid more in taxes than they took in, in, in share of income, the top 1% had a net gain of over 11%. So when they say that they're paying their fair share, they are not paying their fair share. When they say because the income tax is so high that they pay too much, they're not paying too much because they don't get most of their income from wages. They get it from rents, they get it from dividends, they get it from stocks, and other capital gains. And so that when we look at these numbers, we shouldn't be fooled that, gee, the rich aren't they paying too much already. If you watch Fox, you might believe that, but anyone who thinks about it knows otherwise. And I think this diagram from Move On, I think, says it best. If you're one of the lucky 25 hedge fund managers that made over a billion dollars, you're paying an effective tax rate of 15%. While if you're a cop making 55, you're paying about 25%. If you're, if you're a little higher bracket as a professional, maybe 28%, but you're in the big time, you don't, you don't carry your load. Now, Social Security tax, now, the, the handout that I gave you is, are some old numbers. The tax rate is 7.65 if you're earning $50,000 a year. But if you're earning, if you're earning a million dollars a year, because of the cap 
on Social Security. It drops to less than 1%. And if you're earning $5 million, it drops to a fraction of that. And so if we ever want to solve the Social Security problem, removing the cap and treating everyone equally, making it a true flat tax, would be one way of doing that. Now, the reason we have problems as far as I as a trade unionist are concerned is that unionization in our nation is at 12% while it's much higher uh, in other democracies. Now, of course, it has impacts on the social wage. If you look here, the U.S. is at the very bottom, 12%. Here we go again. At 12%. Other nations cover, cover their people when it comes to health care. Obviously, we don't. Other nations offer paid maternity leave. We don't. Other nations have guaranteed minimum annual vacations, and we don't. That's because other nations have a strong labor movement, and we don't. Life expectancy and cost. Because we have a for-profit health care system, it is the most expensive in the world. As this graph indicates, there's the United States at the very top in terms of cost. But when it comes to life expectancy, we're 77 and a half years. Other countries paying much less have better outcomes than we do. And much of that is due to, is due to the for-profit healthcare system we have. Another horrendous example is the impact of the tax structure and government programs and benefit policies on child poverty. We are horrendous when it comes to that at 2.4 percent, while a nation like Poland is able to reduce with its policies, its public policies, that down by 29 percent. That's from UNICEF, it's uh, 2000 report, it's kind of old, but I think it makes a point. Now in 84, you can see from this graph that most everything is blue except for Virginia and North Carolina. There is some unionization uh, above 10 percent in just about every state in the nation. In 2004, all that white means is that it's less than 10 percent. And the states in red are currently being challenged with regard to maintaining their union strength. Now, the National Labor Relations Act, we see how unf unfair it is, which is part of the problem in terms of organizing the public sector. I'm pressed for time, so I want to continue. If you had truly democratic elections, all parties would have equal access to voter lists and voters. Uh, voters couldn't be intimidated or threatened. Voters could be forced, would not be forced to listen to only one side. One side cannot delay elections and their outcome. And of course, voting would happen in a neutral place, not in the campaign headquarters of one of the candidates. Yet in NLRB elections, all those things are allowed to happen. Is it any wonder that we can't organize? So we know the theories about collective bargaining is certainly not the practice. I think Dr. King put it very well. Those who would destroy or further limit the rights of organized labor 
do a disservice to the cause of democracy. Human Rights Watch has found that there are legal obstacles that tilt the playing field so steeply against workers, freedom of association, that the United States is in violation of international human rights standards. 32 million workers are not covered by, by collective bargaining law, including public employees in some 23 states. We have tried to respond to the attack on public workers with a book that we sent out to every member of our union, arming them with the facts to respond to the myths, these myths that are out there about public workers and government. I have a few extra copies. I'll leave them up here. If you're interested, you can come and get them. But there, this book is also available on our local website, which, is, uh, which, which you'll find in your handout. We point to the scapegoating. We point to how government is being shot to pieces so that it cannot function and deliver services to the public. So the public becomes even more cynical about government. It's that vicious cycle. You pay your taxes, but your children don't get educated. You pay your taxes, but your streets don't get cleaned. We know the culprits, and we know what they've done, and how they are on the dole from government. So when it comes to the bankers, these fat cats up there, we have socialism for them and free market capitalism for everybody else. So we're fighting back. If we want progress, we must organize. We must organize our members, our families, and our neighbors. We must educate ourselves in the public. We must agitate for social and economic justice. And we must demand government by and for the people. That is the message that we started this spring with our members. We turned each of these into flyers that we gave out over seven weeks leading up to the city's budget negotiations, final budget. And we are continuing now to educate our members to do what they need to do to challenge their very own families when it is pointed out by some stupid brother-in-law like I have that you damn unions are the problem. That's why this country's in the mess that it's in. You've heard it from people. And you, you public workers, you don't do nothing, you get all this money. And you got a pension. Well, the holidays are coming up. You're going to have to meet with those obnoxious in-laws anyway. So you might as well set them straight. And that's the message we're sending to our members. And we're training trainers to do that in October in time for Thanksgiving. So that is our move forward to address the issues that we face. And you have information about me, where you can reach me, and the website to pick up a, a copy of, of this if you'd like. Uh, I apologize that I, I have a, a uh, family emergency that requires that I leave right now. But uh, if you have any questions, you have my email address. Uh, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much for listening. Our next speaker is Glenn Ford. He is the executive editor of the Black Agenda Report. Good evening. Power to the people. Uh, when I realized uh, that uh, I wasn't going to be able to attend because I had to do studio work, I wasn't going to be able to attend the conference, I had uh, a lot of anxiety. Uh, because if you're not at the conference, you worry uh, that uh, people are going to cover the topics that you wanted to cover and you just be uh, redundant and everything that you thought was new knowledge was actually just old hat. So uh, I came here with, with a lot of anxiety. 
but I decided that there is one little area uh, that I do uh, know uh, something about. So I thought that I would tell you a story, and I, I hope you bear with me. Uh, this is a story that comes from the very recent past. It starts only about 15 years ago, uh, but it changed uh, the black political world and therefore uh, the world that progressives operate in. Uh, this story uh, relates directly to the ascension of, black, of Barack Obama uh, to the White House, but it's not really a story about Barack Obama. Uh, it's really a story about white people. It's specifically a story about white corporate folks, the white corporate class, and how they created a new cadre of thoroughly vetted and dependably loyal black corporate politicians and then embedded them in the Democratic Party. And that is a very recent phenomenon. That story, I believe, is central to the crisis that has crippled progressive politics in the United States. Uh, it begins in the mid-90s. It begins in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, in the headquarters of the Bradley Foundation. Uh, that was George Bush's favorite foundation. The president of the Bradley Foundation at that time was a guy named Michael Joyce. Uh, he realized that the right wing was getting nowhere uh, in terms of penetrating black American politics. And his mission, he decided his mission, uh, was to drive a wedge between the two pillars of the Democratic Party, and that is blacks and unions. And he had to find a formula in order to do that. Uh, Michael Joyce understood that black republicanism was at a dead end. Uh, there had not been a black congressperson elected from a black majority district since Oscar de Priest left his seat in 1935. There have been black congresspersons who were Republicans, but they all came from white districts, and that does not count as penetration of the black community. So obviously, black republicanism uh, wasn't working. Uh, the right had already uh, gone the route of subsidizing black academics, uh, giving them chairs through dona donations, uh, contributions to universities, uh, putting them on talk show circuits. You, you've heard their names, Thomas Sowell, Glenn Lowry. There was a whole coterie of, of them. But the problem was nobody was listening to these people except conservative uh, whites. Uh, black people were paying them no attention whatsoever. So there was no effective uh, penetration by that route uh, into the black community. Michael Joyce was aware of that. And he decided that in order to the, for there to be uh, an effective right-wing penetration of the black polity, it would have to be through the Democratic Party. Because the Democratic Party is where black folks live, the Democratic Party is where black politics uh, takes place. So the Republican strategy and the black ac academic strategy uh, should be put to the wayside. Uh, Michael Joyce and uh, the Bradley Foundation uh, had two problems. One problem was that he needed an issue that would attract a largely new cadre of black political opportunistic politicians. And the other problem that he had, and this is just as important, is that he would have to set in motion uh, a chain of events, a, a kind of process that would acclimate uh, his peers, the people that he worked around, the people with the money, these white corporate guys, would acclimate them to, oh, being in the same room, the same cocktail party uh, with more than one or two black people. Because the truth of the matter is, and was, at least in the mid-90s, uh, that these right-wing Republican corporate types with all the money had a reflexive kind of racism that did not allow them uh, to, to create these kinds of, 
of, of black, uh, black uh, populated uh, political gatherings where they could talk to them and make deals with them and even begin uh, to create a kind of uh, comprador situation. So that was a problem for Michael Joyce as well. The truth is that this kind of visceral white corporate uh, uh, rejection of being around too many black folks had actually given uh, black politics uh, a kind of respite for decades, that is the decades uh, between the 90s uh, and the black uh, civil rights and, and black power uh, eras. That is, uh, corporations had not invested any serious money or effort in black America, uh, except again, through these black republicanist schemes uh, and the funding of black academics. Uh, they, they had all this vast wealth and they had created AstroTurf uh, and front organizations all across the spectrum of the American, uh, of American politics. They had labor front organizations and environmental front organizations and education front organizations, but they had never uh, been able to bring themselves because of their racism uh, to create an AstroTurf uh, black front organization that did not have the mark of the Republican Party on it. And of course, that was the mark of death. Uh, they had never poured serious money uh, into any tailor-made front organization that was populated largely by democratic politicians. And therefore, on the face of it, they had not made a serious uh, effort to change the political complexion of the black community. Uh, Michael Joyce understood that, that they have all this power, but because of their racism, they had not used it. And uh, well, that was very good for us, but that time was about to come to an end. Uh, we can look to those decades as a period when we were not infested uh, on, uh, on the uh, precinct level uh, at, in, in terms of uh, city council and even congressional ele elections by this kind of corporate money that was floating around everywhere else uh, in the country. Uh, Michael Joyce decided he was gonna change all that. Uh, he had the money and he believed that he had an issue. Uh, remember that it was during the reconstruction era that state legislatures uh, brought public education uh, to the South. It is well understood, certainly in black America, and I think Michael Joyce understood it too, uh, that uh, as an ideal, education uh, is revered in the black community. Uh, Michael Joyce also knew that black people were deeply frustrated uh, with their inner city schools. If the, black, if the Bradley Foundation uh, could come up with a formula uh, through de deploying all its money, the, the millions at its uh, disposable, the disposal, that would drive a wedge uh, between black parents and teachers unions, well, that would go far towards destroying those twin uh, pillars of the Democratic Party. That would be miraculous uh, from their standpoint. Uh, and that's how this organization called the Black Alliance for Educational Options was born. And it cost the Bradley Foundation about $2 million. The Bradley Foundation created this front organization out of whole cloth. It was invented in the mind of Michael Joyce. Uh, that organization uh, demanded uh, public funds for private school vouchers. That, that was a, a long-term, long-standing project of the Bradley Foundation and lots of other right-wing corporations. Uh, and if they could not get that, uh, they demanded uh, charter schools. At that time, in the mid and late 90s, uh, these conservative corporations were working both tracks. Uh, uh, vouchers for private schools, and also they were becoming deeply involved in the charter school effort. Uh, they, they made it into a charter school movement because that's what money can do. Now, we must understand that never in the history of black America had black folks ever demonstrated or rallied or demanded vouchers for private schools. And in fact, uh, these vouchers were associated uh, in black minds uh, with segregation academies. This was totally off of the black radar, but 
Bradley had millions, and they had experience working with other groups. And uh, Michael Joyce decided that he could put it on the radar through the strength of his money. Uh, Bradley didn't have any problem, once the call had been put, up, put out, uh, getting a quorum of opportunistic black politicians, most of them Democrats, uh, to come to the inaugural conference for this black uh, alliance for educational options, and that was in 1999. They had no problem. They had $2 million to spend, uh, and they, they got a good, good crowd. One of the Democrats who came to that inaugural conference was Cory Booker from across the river in Newark, uh, New Jersey. At that time, he was just a first-term uh, councilman. He was already involved with the school voucher people, uh, with that entire network, but very few of us knew uh, how deeply he was involved or, or, or the actual uh, workings of that network. I knew Cory Booker uh, because I covered Newark for a small uh, black northern New Jersey paper that I helped found. Uh, and I knew that his coming out party uh, was at a Manhattan Institute uh, power luncheon. And I knew that if you, are, uh, if you have your debut at the Manhattan Institute power luncheon with the assembled media around, and that's their division of labor, their specialty within that whole vast right-wing conspiracy, it is media. That's why they're Manhattan. And so you know that he uh, was vetted. But it didn't occur to me, and certainly not to anyone uh, I was in conversations with, uh, that this was more than uh, Corey getting lucky uh, and hooking up with some right-wing uh, white millionaires and, OK, that son of a bitch. Uh, but I didn't think much, much of it. Uh, we didn't understand what vetting meant, since we didn't understand that there was a, a plan. Uh, I then went to uh, Booker's rally uh, in 2002, where he announced that he was going to be the candidate uh, for mayor uh, of Newark. Remember, he's still a first-time uh, councilman. And after the rally, I go back uh, to, to the internet to see what kind of reaction there would be uh, in the media. And I was amazed. It knocked me on my butt. The whole internet was lit up. Every single uh, right-wing foundation outfit in the country was cheering that Corey, not Mr. Booker, Corey, the very familiar Corey, uh, was in the race. And they were cheering him on. And I, I, it was only at that moment that I realized that he was their champion. He was their black champion. Uh, and this was an organized effort that Corey really had back. It wasn't that he just ran into some white guys uh, associated with the uh, Manhattan Institute uh, and they did him a solid or something. Uh, he, he, was, he had the backing of a whole network and, and they were lighting up uh, the switchboard, so to speak, uh, 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 on the internet. And, and then it all became, became very clear. It was, it was like a revelation uh, to me, uh, that the right was mounting a concerted effort to capture the city hall of a quintessentially chocolate city, that this was something that was designed to change the paradigm of black uh, politics. A and so it unfolded. All of a sudden, strange people uh, are arriving in Newark, strange people, mostly young white people, uh, populating Cory Booker's campaign. Strange people filling up the hotels and strange money, tons of money, money that Newark politics had never seen before. And remember, Sharp James was universally considered the most powerful black politician uh, in New Jersey and crooked enough uh, to get all the millions that he needed. But Cory Booker obviously had far more money than Sharp James and in-kind services from all these strange new people. Uh, as, as well. Uh, uh, let's make that, that part of the story short. Cory Booker uh, almost uh, won. And if there had not been a black commentator, which was the predecessor to Black Agenda Report, and if we had not uh, done uh, some due diligence in exposing, I'll just let that keep on ringing and it'll stop. If in, in exposing him uh, as a front for white 
corporate people, he would have won. He barely uh, was beating, beaten. And the other part of the phenomenon was media attention on Newark was something like Newark had never seen. And there was universal corporate media endorsement of Cory Booker. Uh, and there were media outlets that had never endorsed anybody, media outlets that didn't have a news department that were endorsing Cory Booker. It was unanimous. It was a real phenomenon. So here we had a black man, a black Democrat that the corporations could love. Now I know in you know, 2011 that doesn't seem strange, uh, but in 2002 it was strange. It was a new uh, phenomenon. Uh, in fact, we, we have to j borrow Joe Biden's uh, language uh, to really describe the reaction uh, to Cory Booker. People were basically saying uh, that was, he was clean and articulate, and we find him quite acceptable. <clears throat> no sooner had Cory Booker almost won uh, that election, that was in April of 2002, than uh, progressive black congressman Earl Hilliard in the Black Belt of Alabama was deposed from his seat uh, by a little-known prosecutor who had only two years uh, before run against him and only got 30% of the vote. It was the same situation in Alabama as we saw in, uh, in Newark. Uh, strange people, strange folks filling up the hotels, and strange money, and it certainly was not uh, traditional uh, uh, democratic money and uh, Earl Hilliard was just swamped and he was swept out. And then only a couple of months later, in August of 2002, it was Cynthia McKinney's turn. And it was the same scenario. Uh, this little known, uh, once a Republican uh, uh, black woman, uh, attracting megabucks from who knows where, and total, total uh, media endorsement uh, of, uh, of her campaign against Cynthia uh, McKinney. In fact, it became a national campaign. The Washington Post and the New York Times and everybody was focusing on, were focusing on uh, this race, that this was a watershed race in the black community. Uh, obviously, they had been uh, spoken to and cultivated. Look here, look, something really important is happening. Uh, this this uh, conservative uh, 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 black Democrat uh, is deposing uh, this radical from the past, this, uh, this, this black congresswoman who speaks a civil rights uh, type of language. Uh, this organized corporate penetration clearly uh, was going to wreck, I believed, at that time in 2002. It was going to wreck uh, the black union coalition and it would cripple the progressive project in the United States. That was clear to me in 2002 because there was for the first time a corporate offensive underway to change black politics at the congressional district level and the mayoral level, right down to the bone. They were messing in black folks' turf like they had never done before. And, we, we, and I realized where it was coming from, from these, corporate, uh, these foundations like Bradley and the rest. Uh, that was a watershed year in American politics. The corporate offensive among Democrats was accompanied by a media offensive that declared that not only uh, were these business-friendly black politicians uh, getting elected, but that black people, black people were turning to the right. Now they had been saying this many times before. They, white people have been looking for that new Negro who was more reasonable forever. But for the first time, because of these electoral triumphs, backed up by big money in this concerted offensive, uh, they seem to have proof uh, of that. Uh, the 2002 elections put in place in the Congressional Black Caucus, a small but critical mass of right-wing uh, uh, members who previously did not exist. Uh, before 2002, there was one, and his name was Floyd Flake, and he was the congressman from Queens. Uh, and he resigned in the uh, late 90s in order to make more money uh, in the school privatization business, 
and to uh, dedicate more time uh, to the Manhattan Institute, where he's a fellow, and to the Black Alliance for Educational Options, where he's on the board along with Cory Booker. But in 2002, with these elections, they now had, excuse me, they now had uh, Arthur Davis from Alabama. They had Denise Majette replacing Cynthia McKinney uh, in Georgia. They had a new uh, right-wing black Democrat from Atlanta uh, called David Scott. And they had this new convert to uh, uh, Republican style uh, politics, uh, this right-wing Democrat convert uh, named Harold Ford Jr. Uh, from Tennessee, who in one year uh, just did a 180 degree uh, turn in his, in his voting record. From that point on, the Congressional Black Caucus, which called itself the conscience of the Congress and actually sometimes acted that way, from that point on, the Black Caucus could not, as a body, take any progressive initiative because the caucus had previously acted uh, uh, based on consensus uh, within the caucus. Uh, and before this uh, corporate offensive, they often found consensus, consensus around progressive positions because the black community in the United States is the most progressive constituency in the United States. But after 2002, that was no longer possible. So we see the fruits in just a few months of this, of this uh, avalanche, this tidal wave of Republican money, uh, this very dedicated campaign in terms of what it uh, did to the Congressional Black Caucus and therefore national black politics. So again, 2002 was a watershed year. Uh, all of these right-wing black Democrats uh, became active, of course, in the Democratic Leadership Council, the DLC. Barack Obama, only comes to our attention uh, at the Black Commentator when his name comes up on the DLC's uh, membership list, and that was in uh, the summer of 2003, and we all know the story from there. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that the prototype for Barack Obama, uh, this new kind of corporate black politician, was actually Cory Booker, and that Cory Booker was born deep in the womb of the Bradley Foundation of Milwaukee, which was George Bush's favorite foundation. Uh, he was one of the early vectors of right-wing uh, Republican policies, uh, school privatization, uh, an all-out assault on teachers' unions, uh, a, a conscious attempt to split the black community, and those policies became the policies of the first black president not too many years later. The Bradley Foundation's public school, pri public school privatization plans through uh, vouchers or through uh, aggressive charters uh, became George Bush's policy and it is now Barack Obama's policy. The other Bradley Foundation policy invention was faith-based initiatives and it was invented uh, specifically to buy off black preachers uh, into the Republican Party or into the, the right-wing firmament or uh, milieu, if you like. Uh, one of Obama's first acts upon becoming president, uh, little known, uh, was to expand uh, the uh, faith-based initiatives. Uh, but Cory Booker, again, was the prototype. So the question then becomes, have blacks really moved to the right, as that unanimous corporate media says. Uh, and is, if that were true, is the progressive coalition salvageable? Uh, I think it is. Uh, the Cory Bookers of black America, and there are lots of them now, are still trying to hide their deep connections to the corporate right. Cory Booker tries to hide those connections still and there isn't much of a media out there to uh, expose him. Barack Obama's politics are not in sync uh, with black America. The fact is that black people are in love with the feeling of having a black person in the White House, but black people don't even discuss his politics, that is, his, his policies. Black folks talk about how 
Barack Obama is doing, not what he's doing. The conversation is about who his enemies are, and then they are taken to be our enemies. What has changed, and I'm almost through, what has changed is that corporate money has targeted black America like never before, and I can't say it too often. Uh, this is a relatively, uh, a very uh, recent phenomenon. It's only about a decade old. But you can't change the historical worldview of a people simply by funding some black, democratic, right-leaning, uh, business-loving candidates. That can't happen. It certainly has not happened in the space of just 10 years. But this is a whole new ball game, and the corporate right does have a game plan for black America. And I don't know if that can be said uh, for those of us on the progressive side. Thank you. And our final speaker through all of the alarms will be David Howell. He is a professor at New School University and the director of the doctoral program in public and urban policy. I can't read my own writing. Ooh. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for the, to the ERPI coordinators uh, for inviting me and for, for organizing this. Yeah, let me lift it up. I'm a little taller. Is that better? Um, okay, so, um, I may not be able to yeah. make it full screen because the mouse yeah. for some reason. Is okay, right. just go back to the, the title. Um, I was given the title research for the, wor for the working class. Um, my, s can you go back to the title? Sure. Yeah, so the, um, um, <coughs> More specifically, I want to talk about the need for um, fundamental research uh, uh, that challenge, f challenges free market orthodoxy. And I'm going to try to do this um, very quickly. It's 10 of 6, supposed to be over at 6. It's been a long day and a trying day with, uh, with the beep, the, the, this awful noise. Um, so this morning, uh, we had Dean Baker talking, emphasizing to us that we should get the facts straight, uh, the arithmetic straight. Laura Dresser emphasized the importance of organizing and demonstrating and, um, and political action. We now just heard from Arthur Chiliotes, um, uh, who addressed both, really. And then Glenn Ford just gave us what was um, a fascinating and um, depressing story about um, money and race and politics. My focus is going to be on ideas and on the importance of getting um, uh, ideas for setting the terms of the debate, uh, the importance of fundamental research for what passes as conventional wisdom. And I'm going to argue that conventional wisdom has swung from sort of public to private solutions, and that that's a really important, those are very important ideological shifts, and that, that sw th those swings have got stuck on the right side in the last couple of decades, and we need to think about how that's possible. And money uh, and foundations play a big role there. Uh, so jo Joseph Schumpeter, a very important uh, economist who was uh, uh, um, the finance minister f at the end of World War I for Austria, came and was a major, uh, came to the U.S. and was a major, a very important, uh, distinguished professor at Harvard. Uh, he argued, uh, quite conservative actually, but had some profound observations, and one of them was that uh, the way we see the world, our vision of things, uh, is critical for how we, uh, we understand interrelationships and how we go about doing research if we're economists. What questions are asked, what theories are used, what, uh, how do we come up with research designs and data. Um, once we've done all our empirical work, what are the, um, uh, which regression runs, which statistics do we choose to promote, which ones do we choose to publish. 
and how does it then tr get translated into the conventional wisdom into common discourse? Keynes uh, is incredibly quotable, and the one that is uh, one of the most popular and seems very appropriate for this audience and for the issues that we're addressing is the following. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler a few years back. I'm sure the power of vested interests is vastly exaggerated compared to the gradual encroachment of ideas. And that was in the general theory in 1936. Now Krugman um, mentions that, although he doesn't quote it, uh, just a few months ago in, uh, on his blog. And let me read this. I think it, it, it speaks, um, it, 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 it's exactly the point I want to make. The whole point is that stimulus is supposed to put resources that would otherwise be unemployed to work. And this is what Dean Baker said, uh, exactly what you said this morning. But at this point, a large part of the economics profession no longer understands that. So why should we expect politicians to get it? The point is that GOP ignorance on macroeconomics isn't like GOP ignorance on, say, climate science. And the argument he goes on to, uh, uh, the, 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 the point he makes there is that it's all about uh, vested interests in the climate science debate. In the case of macro, the nonsense is coming from the established economists with lots of widely cited papers. Paul Ryan doesn't have to distill his madness from the scribbling of hacks at Heritage. That's a very important conservative foundation. Although he does that too, he can get over some very, uh, I'm sorry, he can get over some nice wine from, he can get it over some nice wine from tenured faculty at the University of Chicago. Now it used to be the University of Chicago was the right wing place for this stuff. It's, uh, there was a salt water and fresh water, fresh water were conservative um, doctoral programs, universities, Carnegie Mellon uh, in Chicago and many others. Um, Saltwater was Berkeley and Harvard tended to be more liberal. Well, I can uh, assure you that, the universe, that Harvard has become every bit as conservative as Chicago in the last decade. Okay, so the terms of the economic policy debate. America is different and it goes by the term American exceptionalism, right? From, from the times of the founding of the country to the Tea Party, we have a strong libertarian don't tread on me um, ideology. Uh, two Harvard professors, Alicina and Glazer, wrote a, a quite an, a, a, both mainstream professors at Harvard, wrote a very good piece that I would recommend if you're interested in this called Why Doesn't the U.S. Have a European-Style European Welfare State? And their answer is that it was about race. It was about the fear of, of blacks going back to the, um, uh, to the um, New Deal era and the concern about redistribution um, uh, when a large share of those who would get redistributed to were of another color. Um, uh, so, uh, still, given this American exceptionalism, there's clear evidence of swings between the public, public solutions and private solutions. You got the Teddy Roosevelt period around the turn of the century, 1900, 1910. You have the Roosevelt period of the 1930s, the Kennedy Johnson period of the 60s. But then it gets stuck in the 70s and 80s. It swings to the right, not a surprise, but then it gets stuck there. And we don't get Clinton moving very far to the left. You know, maybe he could, he would have, if there hadn't been such a strong um, uh, right presence in Congress. But he was a moderate Democrat. It's not surprising that he um, got the uh, um, um, the nomination on the Democratic Party in the 90s. <clears throat> This is a big change. This has been a shift to the right since, say, the 1950s, the Eisenhower period, which was previously the, uh, the, the, private, the, the swing to the private sector. Back in the 50s, John Kenneth Galbraith, a left liberal, was the most quoted, most read econ economist in the country and in the world, in fact. Uh, that tells you something about the politics of today. I mean, who is reading John Kenneth Galbraith or his equivalent? There's been a couple of op-eds in the last week that I think are worth um, 
citing, quite good. Uh, uh, Ted Marmor and Jerry Mashaw, uh, both Yale professors, wrote uh, in, the op uh, in a New York Times op-ed recently, from the 30s to the 60s, American public discourse was filled with references to the social circumstances of average citizens, our common institutions, and our common history. Over the last five decades, that discourse has changed in ways that emphasize, indiv in emphasize individual choice, agency, and preferences. The language of sociology and common culture has been replaced by the language of economics and individualism. They go on to say that in 1934, the government was with us. We had, thanks, we had shared circumstances, shared risks, and shared obligations. Today, the government is the other, not an institution for the achievement of our common goals, but an alien presence that stands between us and the realization of individual ambitions. Programs of social insurance have become entitlements, a word apparently meant to signify not a collectively provided and cherished basis for family income security, but a sinister threat to our national well-being. So is it, are we at the end of ideological swings? Is it only to be the right now? A lot of it has to do with uh, the kinds of uh, developments that we just heard um, from, uh, from Glenn. They, uh, Michael Kazin writes, like the left in the, in the early 20th century, was, which, which successfully paved the way for the 1930s New Deal, conservatives built an impressive set of institutions to disseminate their ideas. They are think tanks, legal societies, lobbyists, talk radio, and best-selling manifestos have trained, educated, and financed two generations of writers and organizers, conservatives, marshaled me uh, media outlets like Fox News and the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal to their cause. Why the ideological hegemony of free market orthodoxy? Why does the libertarian message resonates so well with the bottom 80%, in whose interests it clearly isn't. One small example is the takeover of the economics department of the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, located in Paris, uh, representing the, the, the rich capitalist countries. Uh, in the 1980s, the economists were quite liberal institutionalist types, who were very careful not to um, do clearly ideological work. That changed in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, the world of economics and policy making in the Reagan-Thatcher years really did change in it. And it, it also reflected a change in, the, in economics training and economics departments across the country. Uh, and to some degree across the world. Most of the best economists are trained in the US, so European economists became increasingly right-wing, having been trained at US institutions. I would argue that the power of simple store economic stories, um, uh, it's the power of simple economic stories that put the individual front and center, especially when told by those with big credentials, Harvard economists winning Nobel Prizes, that um, help explain this ideological hegemony. Again, going back to Keynes, uh, ideas matter. So what we had in the 70s through 90s was a return to the Adam Smith of the invisible hand, where rational, the rational economic man operating in perfectly competitive markets was the model. Rational expectations at the macro level became the basis for macroeconomics. The answer was laissez-faire, deregulation, and the dismantling of the state, and particularly the welfare state. But as Dean Baker has shown in his book, The Conservative Nanny State, um, this was true with the exception of dismantling those aspects of the welfare state. Uh, that's also downloaded, uh, downloadable, by the way, at, um, at his um, CEPR site, uh, uh, CEPR. What was set aside was another side of Adam Smith, which was, which um, 
and there and there's lots of good quotes in but here's one given the, our concern with wages and jobs now seemed appropriate what are the common wages of labor okay, he's writing this in the early 19 early 1770s all right published in 1776 what are the common wages of labor depends in every depends everywhere on the contract usually made between those two parties whose interests are by no means the same. The workmen desire to get as much, the masters to give as little as possible. The former are disposed to combine in order to raise the latter in order to lower the wages of labor. It's not, however, difficult to foresee which of the two parties must, upon all ordinary occasions, have the, the advantage in the dispute the force and force the other into com uh, compliance with their terms. The masters, being fewer in number, can combine much more easily, and, and the law besides authorizes, or at least does not prohibit their combinations, while it prohibits those of the workmen. And I'm sure Arthur knows this, but this is a quote that he, these quotes could go very effectively, I think, in his, um, uh, his slideshow. Uh, so what I think has to happen is to get people, pundits and policymakers, to refer um, um, to the right, not the right wing, but the right academic scribblers. Um, I got my, I cut my teeth in economics uh, under in David Gordon's Institute for Labor Education and Research in the mid '70s. Uh, he was a um, my dissertation advisor at the New School and um, organized this institute. And it does much uh, the same thing as um, Jim Stanford's Economics for Everyone. Uh, Jim Stanford is a New School graduate and a David Gordon student and works for the Canadian Auto Workers and has a new book out called uh, Economics for Everyone. Dollars and Cents, which is out in the, uh, in the lobby, does the kind of work that students and all people need to read. Bowles, Edwards, and Roosevelt have a book, uh, Understanding Capitalism. These books have to get into the, in, into the high schools and colleges, uh, much more than they are. At a second level, we need to support and broadcast progressive research that changes minds. And Netta Bernhard, who was here this morning, does extraordinary work uh, out of NELP. Um, uh, the National Employment Law Project on low wages. Bob Polin, uh, always a, a big supporter and activist in ERPI up at UMass Amherst on living wages. Michael Reich, uh, one of David Gordon's colleagues back in Harvard in the late 60s, has done extraordinary work recently on the minimum wage. Um, uh, my work uh, has, has attempted to address some core beliefs that that rule uh, in current mainstream labor economics. Uh, one is on the, the nature of the growth in labor in inequality. Very, uh, another has to do with unemployment. Uh, and um, let me just very briefly um, mention the outlines there. In the, in the orthodox view, wages are set in competitive labor markets according to a worker's marginal product. So the extra, you know, if you're paid more, you're more productive. Uh, the marginal product reflects skill. That's where your, the productivity comes from. The skill is measured by education. So people should get more, edu there should be more educational attainment. What's led to the increase in demand for skill? It's computers, computerization, information technology. Computers have reduced the um, demand for workers in the middle, those blue collar jobs, the communication workers, Arthur's communications workers, the auto workers, lower demand for them because they can be replaced. Now they're outsourced and offshored as well. At the same time, at the very bottom of the ladder, some are protected by, uh, uh, by unions and others are simply not routine and can't be outsourced, outshored, and replaced by technology. So you get this um, polarization, moderate increases in earnings and employment at the bottom, a collapse in the middle, and a rise at the top. I've criticized this for ignoring power, for ignoring institutions, 
in, a, in an article called Theory Driven Facts and, the, and Earnings Inequality in ERPI's journal, The Review of Radical Political Economy. Um, what explains the, the pattern of unemployment across countries? Well, uh, it's about demand and supply, and I'm going to um, um, not go into the details. It's been t too long a day, and it's too noisy. But um, uh, the, the basic gist of it is that um, workers are paid, that workers are paid wages that are too high. The welfare state in, introduces uh, uh, labor market rigidities that uh, through collective bargaining, through employment protection laws that keep wages high and um, that, re that leads to reductions in employment and, and demand for workers by employers, and that's the source of unemployment. That's why you get eurosclerosis. That's why European unemployment rates were higher in the 90s than, than the U.S. Well, it turns out that now unemployment in the U.S. is high, as high as France and, and way higher than Germany. Well, the fact is that the European unemployment rates, um, many countries were, had lower unemployment than the U.S. It was just ignored by places like the Wall Street Journal. The Scan Scandinavian countries always had lower unemployment. Big Sweden for a few years in the 90s didn't, but generally um, Denmark, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and Austria all had lower unemployment rates with a very strong welfare state and much less inequality. The second piece is supply. The story here is that if you have, you have unemployment benefits, workers won't work hard because workers only work for pay. And I, it's sad to say, but you know, my friends like Sam Bowles and other uh, Marxists um, uh, take this very orthodox view that unemployment benefits provide power to workers. And you know, there's an element of truth to that. It, you know, if you can, if you can live without a paycheck, then you can bargain har harder for higher wages. It, it takes the sting out of unemployment. But the reality is, most workers want to work. People work because not just for pay; they work because it has to do with their identity. Uh, um, people don't want to sit at home. There's a stigma to being unemployed. The reality is, if you got paid 100%, unemployment benefits were 100% of, of what you were earning before, most workers would stay on the job. And there's lots of evidence. But in orthodox circles, and unfortunately in a lot of radical circuits, that's not the case. So, so this provides a, um, a, uh, a way to attack unemployment benefits. Any income support for the unemployed reduces their incentive to work. And um, that is, in fact, um, orthodox, uh, orthodox economist's explanation for the persistence of long-term unemployment in the current crisis. Uh, uh, that um, if we didn't have those extensions of unemployment benefits, we would have, um, have short-term unemployment, but no long-term unemployment because people would lower their wages their wage demands and price themselves back into the labor market. I'm not kidding. Barrow believes that, who, is a, who could win the Nobel Prize. Um, I hope not, but a uh, Harvard professor, um, um, Mulligan at the University of Chicago, David Grubb at the OECD, these people strongly believe this. So there are some, um, there are some papers that I've done um, on protective labor market institutions and unemployment, this is with Dean Baker, uh, who spoke this morning. John Schmidt, Dean's, yeah, I'm, I'm just about done. A uh, couple papers on unemployment compensation, if you're interested in that. That's with Miriam Rehm, a student of mine. And the bottom one is with Bert Azizoglu, another student of mine that's just coming out now, um, which is the attack on Barrow in that view. And then, uh, um, by what measure, the importance of comparing France. France actually does a lot better than we do. Um, their high minimum wage increases um, the floor for wages. And so there's virtually no low-wage workers in France. Jobs just don't pay the lo a low wage defined as two-thirds of the median full-time wage. We have 25%. France, 21, uh, 
Germany, 21%. UK, about 21% of all workers are low pay. France has 5%, right? And it's because of the minimum wage. Does that cause high unemployment? This paper shows that that's not the case if measured properly. Okay, so my conclusion is that Keynes, um, that I hope Keynes was right, that ideas and evidence matter because that means we can fight back and um, change the terms of the debate, change the conventional wisdom. The bottom 80% should be voting democratic, should be voting left democratic, should be voting like the, politic, by, like the middle of the road in Europe, not just the left, but the middle in Europe. Um, we need to be able to tell a heterodox, not an orthodox story with good research. That is not research that we trump up and make up. We, gotta, we have to have scientific standards. We can't, be dis we can't allow ourselves to be dismissed. We have to train good researchers and get the word out about the limits of this notion of a perfectly competitive labor market. What the reality is that the labor market, is, labor market outcomes um, reflect institutions, social norms, and power. And, and Adam Smith knew that, as did the Nobel Prize winner um, Bob Solo and a, a current economist I think is really good uh, named Alan Manning. Uh, we need to get the story out and the current facts right. Dean Baker's CEPR is an important place for that as is EPI. And we need to organize and demonstrate and, and vote. And maybe it requires a third party. So uh, with that, I look forward to having a glass of wine with you. Thank you. No, 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 no. You, you brought up such a such a a, a, a big subject. Uh, the Republican Party. I think I'm saying things that most people here already know. The Republican Party certainly transformed itself uh, uh, um, after the Civil Rights Movement into the White Man's Party in the South. In the South, it is a White Man's Party. Uh, in the South, there really is no need for a Tea Party, <laughs> because the Republican Party is the Tea Party. And I'll, I'll give you uh, an example. Uh, and I don't know if I'm directly addressing your question, uh, just going with what I know. Uh, in, in Georgia, there does not remain one rural white Democrat in the legislature, not one. All of the rural and small town white legislators uh, are Republicans. Uh, and the white Democrats are basically clustered in Atlanta. Uh, it is, it is uh, uh, totally uh, constructed uh, to serve the interests of these oligarchs. And the racial aspect of the party, that, that is the racial face of the party, uh, is so that they can have a mass base. So they have this mass base that is essentially racist, essentially racist, all right? Uh, but their racism sometimes is quite useful to, to, the, to the oligarchy, and sometimes it stands in their way. And that's why you see this, this kind of contradiction playing itself out uh, in Republican circles, uh, uh, because uh, uh, virulent uh, racism uh, acting, acting out uh, on the ground is not always in the interest of those who rule the country. But it is necessary for those who rule the country through, those, through that Republican mechanism uh, to, uh, to cater to that, encourage that, that mass racist base in order for them to be uh, in power. Now somehow the Tea Party uh, story uh, is, is a chapter in that or a, a sub-chapter in that. And the Tea Party is not an independent phenomenon. Uh, what we know as the Tea Party uh, is funded by uh, right-wing oligarchs uh, and is, is just a, a, a manifestation of, of, the, uh, uh, of that uh, firing up the base uh, of stupid uh, uh, racist white people who vote against their interest for the benefit of those oligarchs. But it can cause them problems. It causes them problems. I don't think these oligarchs, uh, many of them, and, and it's not a, a united front, uh, uh, are happy uh, when the uh, fired up uh, racist base, which is so uh, anxious uh, to cut off their own nose, uh, noses in order to spite black and brown people's faces, 
uh, uh, threatened to uh, uh, cause gridlock in the government and uh, problems in financial markets. But that's their contradiction because of the composition of that party. Did, did, did I? Uh, okay. <laughs>